Hello there, welcome, welcome to Home Keepers. Come right on in, my friend. It's gonna be a wonderful, wonderful program today because one of our regular guests has returned and that's Dr. David Clark. And a while ago, we just had a little prayer for the program and I mentioned that when he comes in the room, the energy goes up. There's no question. And um, maybe he's a little different than most psychologists because sometimes they're kind of serious and all, but he is a fine Christian psychologist. And I really believe that his appearances on this program have probably helped a lot of marriages just because of things that he said and it, you know, found a place in your heart and life. And that's why we're here. And we're going to talk today a little bit about grief. He's lost both of his parents recently. And I kind of imagine that uh, studying grief, grief is a little bit in psychology, but it's a little bit different when it hits you personally. And also new books, you know, about marriage and all. I'm telling you, the kind of writer he is, you can't misunderstand him. And he, he will target a subject on marriage or divorce very in a very minute way. And I'm telling you, you'll say, he will say, do this, do this. And you'll say, no, I don't think that's right. He's right. He's done it a lot. So I encourage you to check out his books. And I'm going to join Stephanie for a very healthy one, a low carb mushroom and spinach cauliflower. Could it ever get any healthier than that? And um, I think it's going to taste really good too. Sometimes healthy food doesn't taste really good. I want to offer you again, Dave Williams, a friend of mine, you've met him on this program several times, a book called Faith Goals. When you get as old as I am, sometimes you look back and you, you wish you'd done a lot of things differently. And as I considered this, I thought, I wish I had thought more about goals, written them down, you know, and all that. Well, here's your opportunity. And if you have a goal and you add faith to it, that's a wonderful dimension. And we're offering you this book for any gift to the program. You see, your gifts keep us on the air. And so we let you determine that. And I believe offering something that will help you, help you spiritually, help you in your relationships. And um, that's why we offer you a lot of booklet things that are capsules on really important types of uh, questions and life experiences. So if you use a credit card, 1-800-229-0059, or the address is on your screen, and that's box 6922, Clearwater, Florida, 33758. We love hearing from you. Love your notes. Thank you so much for taking the time to do that. And we got a real healthy one. Going to make This one is so good. This whole bag of cauliflower rice mm -hmm. only has 70 calories. So this is one that will can fill you up. That's what I like. Well, you know, we have a vegan in our midst. Yes. <clears throat> and she's running camera right now. And she called me on the phone to compliment this recipe. Where'd it come from? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to find healthier recipes. Arthleen finds all the gooey, gooey, chocolatey, caramelly recipes. Right, Dr. And I'm Clark. Like, we right. need That's right. more healthy for us other people who yeah. aren't a size But cheap. also <laughs> I like to push uh, control portion of the portion control. because we I'm gonna know, put, we know I'm gonna people. I'm going to put onions and yeah. oil while she talks. We, we know people are not going to eat like that all the time. Yes. So you just don't eat so much. Yes. Now this is my portion control. You can eat this whole entire pan. <laughs> this is only 70 calories. It's mushrooms. It's spinach. It's soy sauce. She has been unkind about my portions. <laughs> I make Don't write letters. I have not. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know, I make homemade soup and put it in jars and freeze it, bring it to work. And it's I, like this much in the bottom I of that, a jar. About a half a jar. Yeah. So. Okay, so I have onions. I'm going to put in some mushrooms. Mm -hmm. I'm going to let those cook down for a moment. Have you used this product? Yes, it all the time at home. Really? Yes, it's so good. It's and, and I try to stay low carb most of the time, so that helps me. I make, it's uh, in the freezer, freezer department. Yes, and you just microwave it. It's so easy. It's so good. You add some soy sauce, some vegetables. It's like fried rice. There's nothing uh, in here that's bad, and it's got uh, mushrooms, onion, clo uh, garlic, yes, spinach, soy mm. sauce. All the good. It's all this, good. You could add broccoli to this. I do that at home and make like a broccoli stir fry. I love so the many taste options. of soy sauce too. So good. So, so very good. Okay, so I'm just gonna just 
I'm trying to saute down. Let these saute down a lot more than I am, okay? Right. Because um, we have a great guest to get to, so yes, we I do. don't have. We you know, one thing we're going to talk about putting the whole bag in. Look at all that—70 calories. We're going to tell you how to recognize a narcissist. Okay. <laughs> I asked before the show started. I said, male or female? Who? The mo I said they're mostly men. Really? Yes. Interesting. And that's from the we could blame a lot of things on men. But when do you put the garlic in? I'm gonna in a minute. I just don't want it to cook too much. Oh. Okay. You like it cooked? I like it. Um, here, I'll put it in here. Okay. Do, 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 do. And that at home, a, I would do a lot more garlic. A that lot is more. a fabulous recipe right there for a good side dish. So this is a meal. This could be a meal. Mm -hmm. Put a little chicken in it. A little broccoli. I'm mm -hmm. gonna do some soy sauce. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to put some spinach in there. It's going to wilt down, and that's going to be your meal. It's so, so good. So this uh, says one tablespoon of soy sauce. I did more. <laughs> but that's the way they yeah. do on the Food Network. Yes. They don't measure anything. You gotta do it. Well, you got to do it to, to your taste, too. Mm -hmm. You could do some, put a little egg Ooh, in here. It's you smelling have good. Make, just stir fry. It's mm -hmm. so good. Fresh spinach. Fresh spinach. So healthy. I there have spinach go. and uh, avocados every day. Yes. At home. And I love smoothie. that broccoli you have slaw that comes in a package. Mm. Do, you, do you get that? So good. Mm. And so easy. It's already cut up for mm -hmm. you. It's already. Now you do this until the spinach wilts down. Wilts. 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 Yeah. wilts. Yeah. That's what melts. It wilts. Yeah. Or melts, depending on if you're a flame repeat. Let me do just a little bit more soy sauce. Please. Well, um, on the. Um, Rice cauliflower. Mm -hmm. I guess I'll find out in a minute. Mm -hmm. um, does it really take the place of rice? You know, it absorbs. I love rice. Well, it absorbs the flavors that you're putting into it, so I think so. Like regular I rice. I mean, listen, if you're trying to eat healthy, you take what you have and you just, in your brain, you make, <laughs> you make it better. <laughs> Talk yourself all. into it. Yeah, so let's. Uh, Let's get this for you because I want you to get over to Dr. And, and remember, we Plaza. usually undercook things a little bit here because we're in a hurry. In a hurry. Yeah. Let those uh, mushrooms cook a lot longer. It's oh. good. It's so good, right? It's surprisingly good. Mm -hmm. It's delicious. It's called so uh, low-carb mushroom and spinach cauliflower rice. But mm -hmm. if you put cauliflower rice on there, we'll know what it is, won't we? But at least put low carb on there for Wanda. Wanda's the one that has to send these out, and she has to find them within the 4,000 recipes that we've done. <laughs> Some of them very similar. So. Yes. yes, every time I, she knows how many, she knows which ones we've done. Yes. And usually when I take one in, she says, we've already done it. Yes, she brought one in this morning. She's like, I've never seen this one. I'm like, we did it. <laughs> <laughs> if you want this recipe, uh, we will get it out to you. Information's coming up on the screen. Many ways you can get it. Choose yours, and uh, we'll get it right out to you. And I will introduce you to Dr. David Clark if you've not met him before. So stay right there. You don't want to go anywhere. If you would like a copy of today's recipe, you may receive it by contacting us through social media as listed on the screen. When requesting a copy through the mail, be sure to include a self-addressed stamped envelope. Thank you, and please know we always appreciate hearing from our viewers. <laughs> well, welcome back. Seems like a long time since I've seen you. Boy, it does. A lot has happened. Yeah. And we're going to talk about grief in a minute because um, I know you and your dad were very close. I think it's amazing that you wrote so many books together. We were a great team. It, yeah, you were yeah. a team, but it's something you could really butt heads on, isn't it? It could. We never did. Mm -hmm. We never did. We, we just, I'm a very different person than Dad, but we worked great together. Yeah, I bet yeah. you miss him, but we'll talk about we him. Do. But um, you just did a podcast on narcissism. I did. I looked it up. It's the Greek mythology says that Narciss was so full of himself. <laughs> he died, this is Greek mythology, he died watching himself in a reflection pool. <laughs> <laughs> that's right, I remember that. That's not mythology, that's reality. <laughs> that could actually happen. <laughs> um, can you define it? Because 
In your work, I'm sure you could spot it rather quickly. Oh yeah, after 35 years. If they slip into my office, we try to screen them out because I hate to waste my time. But if they come in, at least for the wife's sake, I'll, you know, I'll call a spade a spade. But it's world class, out of this world, actually, selfishness. It's a core of it. It's all about me. If I'm a narcissist, I could care less about your needs. I'm not aware of your needs. They're not important. You, I married you to serve me. Complete pilot fish. What I want uh, always, always holds sway. There's no negotiation. There's no, uh, you know, talking about it. It should be my way. And if you do things my way, you'll be happy too. Since I'm happy, there's no compassion. There's a shocking lack of empathy. If I find you crying, if something's upset you, that's your problem. That is not my problem, and it's your fault. I've met those kind of people. I know you have. In the ministry? <laughs> I didn't say that. I mean, they're everywhere. Right, and Ooh. you say there's more men than women? Yeah, about 90% are men in my experience. Well, how, got, do you, how do you explain that? Oh, I don't know. I guess it's just a guy thing. I think guys, by nature, are frankly a little more selfish. Uh, saying you the, heard the, it here. The blonde would agree. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, women are just, I think by nature, just more nurturing yes. and more compassionate. This we is carry built babies in. inside of us. You've got to be compassionate and empathetic. There's a connection there. So I think it's just how God made us. And you want to be confident as a man and a woman in the Lord. But there should be humility along with that, always praising Him. The narcissist is God. He is His own God. And uh, you're supposed to serve one another. It's just... Right. Well, is, is it an American thing? I think maybe more than other countries, uh, but because we just, we're creating narcissists now. The last 10, 15 years, there's been an explosion, breakdown of the family. Uh, you know, Timmy and Susie, especially Timmy, I, I don't have a dad. I, I don't have a connection with my dad. I'm here with my mom. I, my needs aren't being met. So there's just, to protect myself, I, I'm going to make it about me. Mm -hmm. Okay, not healthy. Um, and we see just, you know, the culture itself, this whole social media thing, it's all about narcissism and me. I remember, I wasn't any kind of a counselor in the church, but when you're the choir director, <laughs> somebody comes to you. And I remember this guy coming to me and said, she just doesn't build my self-esteem. You know how good that goes over with me. Said, You've got to be kidding Why is that me. her job? Yeah. In fact, the man is supposed to serve the woman. That's what the Bible says, servant it, leadership. It could be terminology, but I don't like the term self-esteem. No. We're supposed to esteem the name well, of the Lord. Well, that's right. There's, you're only confident. If you have good self-esteem, it's, it's always connected to God. I would call it confidence. Yeah, that's better. Okay. Um, the reason we're talking about this, you did it on a pod podcast. Yeah, I did a contest. A, special a contest, contest on narcissism. <laughs> right. I'm it. giving away two books, two free books of mine for the winners. Yeah. <laughs> Now, it's, narcissists aren't, aren't calling in it's the, or you know, emailing me. It's the people that live that with I'm them. That I'm married with. Right. <laughs> well, uh, is there a cure? Not really. I, I say in the book I wrote called Enough is Enough, which we've talked about, Arthelene, yeah, 4 to 8 percent, and that might be high. Uh, if, if it's a true narcissist, will ever change. It's just rare. I think the major exception would be if you really get saved. Well, <laughs> Really take on the Lord as such an important part of your life. Exactly. Most He'll of them speak to you. don't know Jesus. They think they do. They do not because mm -hmm. their behavior indicates they don't. Yeah, a heart attack, some terrible crisis. My wife has left me uh, or, or God gets a hold of me. Yeah, then God can change anybody if you're willing to do mm -hmm. the work. It'll mm -hmm. take seven, eight, nine months of the narcissist really working on himself, even after salvation. But so many just don't think they need to. They're all, when you're already perfect, Arthelene, you don't have to change. <laughs> I mean, really. When you're just wonderful. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> well, um, I was sorry to hear your father passed away. How long ago did your mother? Mom passed a year ago. It was, uh, let's see, it was, it, her was late April, I think she passed. And dad, the very next year, just a little over a year, mm -hmm. end of May. Yeah. And from what you told me, um, he kind of grieved himself to death. He absolutely He did. really missed your mom. Yeah. Mom was trying to hang on. She was ready to go to heaven, but she told me, Dave, I'm hanging on for your dad. Because she knew, we all knew, he was very dependent on her, loved her to death. He was not going to make it without her. And he didn't. And he really didn't? No. He, he died. moved in with you? He did. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, it took two days, and we, we said, Dad, you're welcome here. We already had it set up. He couldn't stay there alone. He died the day she died. He absolutely did. It was never the same. We worked on a couple of last books while he, because I wanted to give him something to do. I was writing books. I didn't want to write. <laughs> yeah. But I thought, I got to keep published. dad busy. <laughs> I know. But we were working, but his heart wasn't in it. He was still good, but he was just so desperately sad. It was awful to see. 
didn't lose his faith, loved the Lord, knew that mom was in heaven, and he just wanted to go with her. Kind of the way marriage is supposed to be. Well, that's it's right. I mean, that one flesh. Right. I told the blonde. He was ripped. I told Sandy, I expect this kind of grieving when I pass. Uh -huh. Your life is over, and everybody <laughs> should know it. I didn't say that. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, when you're going to school being a psychologist, is this subject addressed? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Big There's, time? Oh, yeah. And of course, you're a young person, you haven't even been through it. I led, I don't know, hundreds of clients through a grief process and not really having gone through it myself. Right. Whoa, and as you said, it's a different animal when it's you. The same principles apply, but now I have to follow my own advice. It wasn't too easy. And what are some of those? I mean, from the book learning, uh, when you're in intense grief, I've, I've had it in spades. Yeah, I've had it there. till I thought I couldn't breathe. Yeah. Oh yeah, just just devastated. Right. Well, you're taught, and this is really true. Elizabeth Kubler Ross did great work. I'm not sure if she ever trusted Christ, but On Death and Dying was her classic book, and she just studied all these people that mm -hmm. were dying. And you know, four basic uh, stages. You've got denial that happens first. I can't accept this. It's so awful. Shock. Didn't happen. <laughs> exactly. Can't, can't really believe this. And then, of course, that moves into anger which again is biblical, and that's fine. I'm furious, I can't live without God. Why would you, even atheists, start blaming God? Well, why would you do that? He's mm -hmm. not around, you don't yeah. believe in him. Yeah. Anyway, uh, and you gotta get through that, and then comes depression, which is probably the hardest stage. Sad, I have to go on without this person, how am I gonna do that? And then, and then that's the longest stage, and then we have then acceptance, where you, okay, you don't get over it, you get through it, you move on. All that takes time. It takes a minimum of a year, 18 months. With a major loss, like a spouse or a child uh, or a super close friend, I mean, you never, you, you, there is some grieving the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. You don't get over it uh, when someone that important dies, but you, you move through with God's help and you live for Him and life gets better. Do people actually come to someone like you because of grief? Oh, they do. Oh, really? yeah. Oh, yeah. And I'm glad they do because it's so hard to, they feel kind of ashamed of themselves and they shouldn't. And they feel guilty. I should trust the Lord and I, I've prayed about this. I say, that's, that's fine. God's going to get you through. But someone talking to someone like me, even only a few sessions, I don't do long grief work. I tell them what to do. That's why I tell people what to do. And here's the, here's the thing. And I, I hear them out. And then they, they're on the right track and they're fine. Mm -hmm. um, I played for, uh, play organ which they don't use anymore. Uh, what happened Churches to the organ? So I know. I love the organ. Uh, my two sisters can play pipe organ. Oh, man. And that, that's the most majestic instrument oh, there is, yeah. I think. They have an organ in heaven, I'm quite certain. Yes. And, and it's a if it's not a pipe organ, it's an Allen organ that sounds just like the pipe <laughs> organ. I, I remember sitting in a service one time, my sister was playing the Allen, and people were singing and all, and boy, she kicked that thing. And the praise... Yeah. Got louder and louder and just oh, lifted up. Just yeah. it's awesome. Awesome. Oh yeah. yeah. Um, and so as I started to say, I played for a lot of funerals, and it gives you a window into the life they've led. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the funeral of a believer is so much different. Oh boy, than a non-believer. Oh yeah, night and day. And also, there are those where nobody comes. Right. I played for mm. one uh, funeral home that was right next to our church across the street. And that funeral director was really kind, decent man. And if nobody came, oh, no one, he would call up my husband and ask him to come over and stand yeah. before the casket and read a prayer and or say a prayer and read some scripture. Well, that was sweet. That was the right thing. You got to have somebody. Uh, right. Yeah. But that's, that's the reflection of the life. Yeah, it is. And the difference in um, the believer's funeral, it, it, you yeah. cannot, you just cannot no. uh, There's sadness and it. there's loss, but it's, it's, it's you know, contrasted with, oh, but, but the hope. We know this person's in heaven and we can celebrate their life. Non-Christians don't have that. It's the end. At, at best, of course, we know it's worse than at the best. They're, they're just nowhere. Mm -hmm. the, the, their life is over. Now, we know it's worse than that. And they don't go there. The ones I've been to for non-Christians, they, they, they always assume the person's in heaven. Well, they were a good person and those people yeah, worse than yeah. them. I'm, I'm quite certain they're, when their whole life they didn't care. No, that's not true. Mm -hmm. You don't stand up and say that, but it's, it's very awkward. Yeah, we had one that um, 
the gentleman who had died was murdered. The murderer was there, we found out later. Oh my goodness. Um, I played one for Hell's Angels, which was Whoa. Re really interesting. Oh, and man. it's just this window yeah. into all kinds. I've seen them fighting at the casket because the gentleman was married twice. Oh, man, and alive. the children like from each opera. wife was battling. And then I've gone, <laughs> when you know, you felt like you were close to heaven because that believer was with the Lord. Yeah. I think it's an opportunity to think about eternity. Boy, it for sure. sure. It sure is. Um, yeah. Looking into the uh, scriptures about heaven gives us a little bit of a viewpoint. But also, I was watching John Ankerberg, who is a great television he's, he's preacher great. for yes. decades. Yeah. And he had a gentleman on there who. Um, was analyzing these out of body experiences. Oh, yeah, right. When they. You hear about the, the, the light, the. Line the whole, up right. with scripture and all. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and I'm sure John Ankerberg was very careful before he put somebody like that on the air. Well, I, right, uh, right. Yeah. And it was very, very interesting because you can get that close to eternity and kind of come back. Yeah, right, which happens. It's, and if it's a believer, well, then we know that it's legitimate. Mm -hmm. If you're not, the ones that bother me are the ones that the person's obviously not a Christian. They write a book about it and, and they're going towards the light. No, that, that's, that's bogus. They, they've been fooled and that's kind of scary, but yeah. And that's too bad. It is. Yeah, that, that kind of gives you the creeps. My husband's grandmother had 15 children, I think. 15? Mm -hmm. And um, wow. two, or th two or three of them died in birth. Yeah. And when she was dying, she saw babies. Oh, wow. You know what? Mm -hmm. I believe that. They're in heaven. No question. Those are people. Mm -hmm. Straight shot to heaven, right? So if, if people came to you needing some grief counseling, some relief and all, isn't that a golden time to lead them to the Lord? It absolutely is. In my office, they're going to get the gospel if they don't know him. Oh, yeah. I have no problem saying I know it's the truth and I, I deliver with confidence. It's up to them to accept it. But this is your opportunity because you're next. Mm -hmm. you, you, you are going to die. It's Everybody, the death rate is still 100%. Last time mm -hmm. I checked, you're going to die. Could mm -hmm. be, you could walk out and get hit by a bus. You, you don't know. Mm -hmm. So now's the time to make that decision. I've got no problem doing that. That's the hope. It's the only hope any of us have. What do you do with that client who comes in? And I know at this age, I'm thinking about things that I haven't thought about in years, years. And everything you could have done better. Yeah. And right. that person who's gone, the uh, relationship could have been better yeah. and all. How do you comfort someone who's beating themselves up that they could have done a yeah. lot better job? Yeah, that's a tough one. There are regrets. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the grieving process. Looking back, you, you should focus on the positive, obviously. I try to get them more on the mm -hmm. positive. But we talk through the regrets very carefully. And okay, own that. If you feel like you sinned or you disappointed the person, then bring that to the Lord. We can do that right now. He'll forgive you for that. And then God is always the God of second chances. Now you can't, with this person who's gone, no chance there. But there are others in your life. Looking at the relationships, we'll talk about it. How can you improve with these people? Well, that's what God wants. So that's how you kind of get drugged, drugged out of it. Satan wants you to stay stuck there. Miserable, regretful. No, no. Confess the sin if there was sin or regret. God forgives you. You've got to talk it out with a psychologist or as we're sometimes referred to as head shrinkers. And that's wrong. We're not head shrinkers. Anyway, and then let's start, let's use this in some way. I would think that would be the number one reason someone would come to someone like you. Right. It's called complicated grief. They are, they, they're, they're, they're it's stuck. It's called complicated grief. Yes, complicated grief. That's one of, one of my books told me that. And they're not, they're stuck. They are stuck in the grieving process. Whether it's in denial, which isn't usually the case, it's anger or depression, they are stuck. They're not getting to acceptance. There are people like my precious dad who, and we had some talks about this because he was very honest. He was never going to stop grieving. He was never going to accept it and move on. He kind of knew that. I said, that, uh, that's your choice. He didn't, it was almost like a, it would disrespect my mom, he thought, which is kind of crazy, that if I somehow move on past this. He was not going to do that. I said, Dad, it's a free country. You, <laughs> and God loves you. It's okay. It's he okay wasn't going to meet somebody new and get <laughs> married. Oh, well, he would have been horrified. Oh, no. Now, no, Mom was it. Mom was his whole life, other than the Lord, his mm -hmm. whole life. 
That's uh, a little bit understandable because of the age and all. Oh, right. 63 years together. Yes. 70, if you count their date, they dated for like six, seven years. That's a long time. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I, I keep thinking about this person who, um, the loved one is gone, you cannot change the history, and they're really beating themselves up. They need to understand the forgiveness of the Lord, but I think they need someone like you. I think that they background. do. We, we do verbalize it, and then I'll have them write a letter, of course, to the, to the deceased person. Of course, they're never going to read it. Right. Sometimes I'll send them to the gravesite. They can do it in my office if they want with the empty chair, but just a tool. But they're seeing, and psychologically, they'll think, well, that, the person has gone. I say, no, no, trust me, and God will help us. As you do that letter, it's as if it's happening. And when you read the letter uh, to the person, it's just like they're there. It will work. That's, it seems to me like that would kind of finalize. Right. It is. It's a final statement, and you include the regrets and the good things. You're saying goodbye. I, the, I'm a, I, everybody I see has to write. Uh, verbally, it just isn't good enough. When you really? write it out, it, 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 there was the final, and then I'll have them maybe, they could save the document, but very often they'll just burn it up, symbolic of I am moving on. Very difficult letter to write. I give the assignment, it takes them like a month to do it. I say, well, let me know when you're ready. I won't see you again until you've written it. And then they come in, it is just brutal. They'll hand it to me. Would you, would you mind reading this? I say, it's not, my person didn't die, it's yours. You're going to have to read it. Oh, you're kidding me. I had one you know, said, I get that. Yeah, it's, but it's brutal. Something that's tangible. Right. It's on it, paper. Right. Final. It works. And they'll cry their way through it, and I'm, I'm kind of a witness, and I'm, I'm supporting them, and it's, it's a catharsis, and it's a, yeah, it's a final statement to that person, and it's just as good as if they were living. It works. Yeah, we had someone very dear to us here just die uh, three or four weeks ago. It was uh, Attorney Joe Pippen. He's on the air with us oh, regularly. I listen to him every Sunday. Yeah. The show wasn't on this last Sunday. That's the reason. Oh, yeah. for heaven's sake. He wasn't that old, was he? No. Oh, I liked oh. him. Oh, we loved him. Oh, And well, I've that's made a special bad. program about him, but yeah. it, was, it was very shocking. Man. But we went to the service and a life well lived, a life consistent. Yes. He was a blessing. That's wow. what you want to leave behind, a blessing. And we're out of time. You're a blessing, by the way. We appreciate you so much. But Dr. Uh, Clark will be back next month, and we're going to talk about um, one of these books, <laughs> one of his many hundreds of books. I destroyed my marriage and wants to get it back. So he really lays it out, understand it, and we'll do it next time. But till then, remember, there's no higher calling than that of a homekeeper. God bless you. If you should miss a Homekeepers program, you can catch up by going to www.ctnonline.com. Click on CTN Programs and then on Homekeepers.